Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and you're all very welcome to our webinar this morning. Uh, my name is Sean Finan. I'm the CEO of the Irish Bioenergy Association. This morning, uh, our webinar is launching the 3C uh, project. I'm delighted to welcome you all, and we have a very exciting lineup of speakers this morning, and indeed, um, we'll have lots of discussion about this important topic. Before we begin, I'd just like to briefly introduce you to the Irish Bioenergy Association. Uh, we are the representative body on the island of Ireland for the bioenergy sector. So we cover the areas of uh, biomass, biogas, biofuels, wood fuels, um, and energy crops. And we also have members which are interested and very interested in this area of, of biochar. We're always open to new members and always open to um, you who are attending this morning to get involved in our project. And there'll be various opportunities uh, during the course of the morning to get the contact information uh, to contact us uh, if you are interested in taking part or getting more involved in this project. We have quite a sizable attendance this morning and it's great to see you all joining us uh, on this uh, dull and dreary morning. Uh, but hopefully um, you will be enthused by the uh, information you received this morning uh, and the prospects that this project and indeed this sector has uh, across many areas uh, of, of uh, our society, including climate action, uh, resource efficiency and others. So to coincide with the Bioeconomy Ireland Week 2020, uh, we launched the 3C project here in Ireland today. Uh, this project is a three-year um, program. Uh, it's an interreg Northwest Europe funded project which sees 13 project partners uh, come together from uh, six uh, countries participating in a transnational um, collaborative initiative aimed at creating a carbon circular economy. The project is the follow-up to the redirect project which investigated the potential to develop indigenous uh, biochar and activated carbon production from underutilized waste and residue biomass. The 3C project aims to move beyond the proof of concept stage and is instead focused on promoting innovation, business development and the circular economy on alternative carbon and charcoal products. Biochar, which is carbon rich, a solid material made by heating biomass in a low oxygen environment, has a wide range of potential applications largely due to their physical structure. It's highly porous and it has a large surface area, so it makes it very effective as a, an absorbent. Biochar can be used for filtration purposes to reduce odors and smells in a wide variety of settings as a soil conditioner, an animal additive and improver for, for, for soils and uh, other organic waste and materials as well as a variety of potential agricultural and industrial applications. Uh, the product, project will look uh, to team up with small and medium enterprises, startups and entrepreneurs to look to develop uh, biochar based products or services and with the cooperation of our project partners from across six different countries provide access to expertise in product development, quality control and marketing. So that just gives you a brief outline of what our uh, project entails. So this morning's program um, has a number of speakers and presenters. Uh, first up will be Tony Quinn. Uh, Tony is from the Department of Agriculture and will present an overview of the bioeconomy in Ireland. Next up will be Stephen McCormack. Stephen works with the Irish Bioenergy Association as our project officer and he is working with myself in delivering the 3C project in Ireland. Uh, next up then after that will be Colin Keyes and Colin is from Farm Mullachie in Wales and as a 3C partner and Colin will speak about the 3C project at a Welsh level and at a farm scale level. Um, and then we have Dr Robert Johnson from Marigna Biofuels who will speak about pioneering biochar product development in Ireland. Um, we will then proceed to a Q&A and panel discussion and joining us for the panel discussion we're delighted to welcome uh, Morris Ryan who is uh, an Erbia uh, Vice President um, and also um, Managing Director of Greenbelt. So without further ado, um, it's time to begin with our first presentation this morning. I'd like to acknowledge and thank the Department of Agriculture for allowing us 
to complete this launch in conjunction with the Bioeconomy Ireland Week um, and um, for giving us the opportunity uh, to be part of that week, which is very important uh, in developing the overall bioeconomy sector in Ireland. So our first presenter this morning is Tony Quinn. Tony is a forest inspector with the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. Um, he has previous experience in both national and EU climate change negotiations and forest bioenergy. So Tony, it's over to you uh, to give us an overview of the bioeconomy in Ireland. So uh, over to you, Tony. Thank you. Thanks very, thanks very much, Sean. I appreciate the introduction. Um, and yeah, it's 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 great to be here, particularly given uh, the fact that we're you know it's bioeconomy week, and um, I'm, I'm very very happy to be here to present to Airbia. Um, uh, I used to do a lot of work with you, particularly on the, the forest side and the forest energy side. So as uh, Sean said, I just wanted to give a, a brief overview of Ireland's bioeconomy policy um, and just to have a, a talk uh, in relation to it and why it's important. So if we start at the start, we can look at the Ireland's national um, policy statement on the bioeconomy that was released in March uh, 2018. Um, which is a world away from where we are now, it seems like, anyway. Sorry, Tony, we just don't seem to be seeing your screen. Um, you might have to just share your screen for us. Oh, apologies. No apologies. Uh, okay, one second. There we go. Is that better? I'll just play the project. Uh, yes, um, that seems to... That's perfect, no. yeah. Thanks yeah. very much, Great, Tony, yeah. great. Sorry about that, apologies. No problem. We're always going to get these gremlins and glitches when we're doing webinars. It's, uh, uh, I've seen plenty of other worse mistakes, so I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so as I was saying, um, just going to run through uh, bioeconomy policy within an Irish setting. And uh, to start off, I think is uh, it's important to say where we started, which was the national policy statement. Um, this was released by um, on Taoiseach's uh, as a Government of Ireland document. Uh, they consulted with a number of uh, departments and agencies and a, a lot of work from Chagas as well. They had a project that uh, we funded, um, DAFM Research that is, that we funded, it was called BioAir. Um, and in that they, they outline what the bioeconomy is, the, the need to address sustainability and circularity, um, very much tying into the, the, the three C's um, the project that, that Airbnb had at the moment. Um, and looking at commercial issues and social development of the bioeconomy. So identifying actions and challenges that are within the bioeconomy and how we can, we can uh, engage stakeholders and, and frame the policy that's needed um, so that we have a, a strong bioeconomy sector within Ireland. Um, they've done that through breaking it down into uh, seven, seven actions. So, those seven actions are, are outlined here. The, the policy coherence bit, which is always very difficult because it's it's never simple. It's uh, across a number of departments and agencies. Um, there's a lot of different views and different opinions, uh, but I suppose the main thing is the fact that we're trying to be resource efficient, be circular in our approach and replacing fossil materials or fossil based materials with bio-based materials. That's, that's probably the, the, the main key to it all. So we, we try to establish a network and we have uh, a list of stakeholders. We have that up and running. We're translating research into real applications. That's done through a non number of uh, research agencies uh, and, and uh, RPOs, research performing organizations. I'll, I'll cover those a little bit later on. So uh, we also looked at the, the primary producer, the public awareness and how important that is to bring people along um, with the discussion and uh, waste definition. That, that's, and, and for yourselves here at this, this is a, a very key issue, waste definition, of course, that's under DCC. Um, well, it used to be DCCAE, I think it's DCCE now at this, this stage. Um, and uh, the, the, the fact that we need to re-examine our waste products and how we can extract more value from them. Um, and risk assessments, of course, is there as well. And looking at the leading value chains in the BioAir project, 
that was the Chagas project, the Daphne funded Chagas project. So that's just some of the, the um, actions, the ongoing actions in the bioeconomy implementation group, which is co-chaired by DAFM um, and Department of Climate Energy and the Environment. Um, and as I was saying, it's very difficult when it comes to uh, integration with, with the, 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 the wider policy framework of Ireland. Um, nevertheless, I think we've done quite a good job. We have been mentioned in a number of policy documents uh, and increasingly so we're in, I was actually this morning, I was filling out the program for government actions and bioeconomy is, uh, is, is prevalent throughout. So it's something that is increasing in awareness. Uh, it's, it's answering um, a lot of those high uh, challenges, those, those challenges that, that face us as, as we, uh, as we progress, you know, the climate action, it, it has the potential to, to uh, help with climate action, but also has the potential to help with biodiversity challenges and environmental challenges. So that's why people are, are um, using it to, to using it as a tool and um, as a tool to, to, to frame challenges. And it's been mentioned throughout a number of documents, strategic documents that is. Um, and what, a little bit of what we've done as regards uh, networking and, and awareness raising. We've had a Bioeconomy Ireland Day. It started out as a day um, that was back in 2018. Uh, we held an event down in the Shield Mine, um, which is the home of uh, um, the IBF, Irish Bioeconomy Foundation. It was a joint event with IBF and um, Beacon, who are now known as Biorbic uh, and DCCAE as well at the time. Uh, since, since that, we've, uh, we've had the Bioeconomy Week. Uh, we had it in 2018. And of course, this uh, is, uh, we're proud to say that RB is involved in Bioeconomy Week 2020. Um, and that's just a little bit about the, the awareness raising that we've had. Um, and then from a, a European side, there's a lot going on um, and probably most pre prevalent is the uh, BBIJU, so the Bio-Based Industries Consortium uh, joint undertaking. There's 3.7 billion um, funding available through public-private partnership um, between the EU and Bio-Based Industry Consortium, which is known as the BIC. Uh, at the moment, we have 123 projects um, and 924 beneficiaries spread across, uh, if I remember rightly, it's 37 member states and associated states. So it has a large amount of buy-in, it has a large amount of money, and I think it just gives an indication of the, the, the level of potential that is seen by the Commission and various DGs within the Commission. Um, and then, uh, as I was speaking about earlier, the research performing organizations that we have within an Irish setting, and um, many of these have, uh, had take, have taken part in, in many EU projects, um, as well as the uh, BBI, JU, and of course, in a national funding as well, through DAFM, EPA, SFI, and um, SEAI as well. So there's Biorbic, which is, I suppose, the, the leading centre. It's an SFI funded centre, and they are looking specifically at the bioeconomy and bioeconomy implementation, working alongside with all these other actors that are out there. Amber, APC, they're, um, they're all progressing areas of the bioeconomy, Meet Technology Ireland. So this slide is just to outline that there's a, there's a lot even at an Irish setting. So it's not just a, an EU setting, it's it, we're now engaging at an Irish setting. Um, and then looking at the leading value chains, these are some of the businesses that are out there that, uh, that have engaged and there's, there's many of them there. Um, I, I think many of you, you will be aware of them and what Fungus Chain has done. Um, and uh, AgriChem Way is a very uh, uh, useful success story that they've taken the the, what was once known as waste, um, well, actually, it, it, it's, it's compounded. They, ha they had um, whey waste from making cheese. They used that to make protein and uh, were very successful in doing so and were able to add value to that waste product. Now, from uh, the whey waste, 
they are making plastics. So that, again, they're adding value. It's about looking at that circularity. How can we extract more and more value? Uh, Libra is, an, is, is another interesting one. They're looking at uh, using timber as carbon fiber replacement in uh, aeronautical industry and in uh, the creation of windmills. So it's about looking at it from a holistic point of view and a circular point of view. Um, and uh, strengthening the commercial prospects of the Irish bioeconomy. There is a, a number of uh, uh, companies that are out there that are engaged and, and looking at this. So uh, without going down through all of them, there, there's, there's some big players there, Carberry, Glambia, they're all progressing um, areas of the bio, uh, bio economy and looking at their own value chains and trying to see where they can uh, extract more value. Um, so the Bioeconomy Implementation Group, as I previously mentioned, is co-chaired uh, co by DAFM and DCCAE, and uh, we uh, we've uh, we're uh, about to launch a public-private uh, co um, consultative forum. Uh, we're trying to progress that now at the moment, and um, we're uh, undertaking awareness campaign. So. Uh, carrying out presentations such as this and the bioeconomy week and um, and we're trying to integrate it into education and uh, into higher education and in primary level education as well so there's there's more work to do and we as of course we still have to work with the companies that are there and the research institutes that are there so i uh, i think that's just to to show you um the, the, the policy level side. And, and I thought I, I might just give an example of what that actually looks like, um, a, a tangible example. And I, um, I use my own sector, the forest sector, um, and just an, an approach taken with um, DAFM and Enterprise Ireland and through the Coford Council. It was a collaborative effort and we sat down together and came up with the ABC of the forest bioeconomy. And in that, uh, Enterprise Ireland were looking at value chains because of Brexit. And from that, they developed a, a map um, of all the value chains within the forest sector, um, which was a very useful map as we were heading into Brexit. Um, and Daphne through the COFOR Council was looking at the uh, long-term forest research. Uh, so the sustainability criteria of forest research. Um, and there was also the the COFOR Council Group on the bioeconomy. So as a result, we, we, we all sat down and we said through the COFOR Council, uh, this is, uh, we're, we're all singing off the same hymn sheet there, we should, we should, we should do more work on this. And um, with the strategic uh, intent of developing a blueprint to move towards uh, 4 million cubic meters in 2016, of course we've gotten there, and then the 8 million cubic meters in 2035, and um, we, we, we owe it to the state to try and maximize the return on that. And then we put out the plan A, B and C. And just to, to show why it's important from a, from a forest sector to, to address that. Um, in 2024, this, this graph that you're looking at is the volume in cubic meters uh, and over, over time, so 2016 to 2035, this is taken from the All Ireland Groundwork Forecast. Um, it's a COFA Council initiative, it's an all-Ireland body, so we have uh, Northern Ireland in, in there as well. Um, and in 2025-24, that circle that I've highlighted there, number two, that's when the private sector will uh, overtake um, Quilta in production of timber. So we'll have more timber coming from the private sector than we will have from Quilta. That's quite important to note. Um, so in 2016, we had 4 million cubic meters. Where are we going to go? It looks like we're going to go to 2035. We'll double that to 8 million cubic meters. And um, with most of that, with most of that new material coming from uh, the private sector. So as I said, we had the plan A, B, C, A, B and C. So we need to justify the sustainability criteria of the forest products. Um, we need to stabilize the value chains that are there, the existing value chains and um, the, the stuff that's ready to go. 
and then start the conversation around uh, the, uh, the, the novel and value add products such as biochar and, and indeed others um, composites and materials and coatings um, and stabilizing the value chain looking at uh, uh, I suppose uh, cross laminated timber is a good example where it's used in Europe and um, why can't we use it here we need to bring stakeholders research community and public and departments and agencies along with us on that conversation um, and we, we need to be able to justify the, the circularity and sustainability in order to, in order to, 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 to have these um, novel value add products. Um, I, I, I want uh, cheekily put in a picture of uh, you there. You is made, uh, you, you is, well, there's a, a, a anti-cancer drug that can be extracted from the you, which is uh, taxol. Um, but uh, there's some species of you uh, that are endangered and about to go extinct. Uh, thankfully, I'd like to say that it's not the Irish you or indeed uh, use in Europe, but uh, elsewhere. So that's why we need to have this, this circularity and sustainability criteria to be able to justify not just the novel and value add, but also our, our existing and um, uh, existing value chains. And um, we also need to be aware of uh, policies, frameworks, waste definitions. So that's the, the plan A, B and C when I'm bringing it together. Um, we actually have uh, uh, launched that from working with EI. We've uh, launched a call and Biorbic and uh, uh, Amber and Trinity have been successful and they've been awarded a project looking at the novel and value add materials. And of course, uh, NUIG have done a lot of very interesting work on in engineered timber. Um, so in conclusion, there's a lot of new business opportunities, value chains. Uh, we need to increase competitiveness. There's the potential for job creation, particularly in a rural setting, which is very important. Rural development, economics and social uh, and environmental sustainability are going to be key, key pillars to building this. And uh, thanks very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Tony, for your presentation and for joining us this morning. And um, we look forward to working with you and the department over the next number of years as we roll out this project. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, if you want to pose questions to any of our speakers this morning, or indeed any of our um, panelists, um, there's a Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. So if you type in your question there, we will endeavor to get to as many questions as possible um, as at the end of the presentations and when we get to the panel discussion. So Treacy is just the latest in a successive string of projects uh, that were designed at valorizing bio-based resources uh, for the provision of bioenergy and now uh, bio-based products, including biochar. Now, by way of an introduction, I'm going to give you uh, an overview uh, from the previous project, which was a redirect. Uh, the project is about seven minutes long, but it gives you a nice understanding of the processes involved. So I'm just going to try and play this for you so that you can hear it and I'll be back to you then, okay. There are many sources of waste biomass that are not being used at present. Experts say that 34 million tons of biomass are wasted in Northwest Europe. If we only use 10% of this potential resource, we could probably avoid 3 million tons of CO2 emissions. We could produce 11 million tons of biochar from these sources for a multitude of purposes. With this, we could create new income sources and new employment. Our European network has developed an interdisciplinary approach. It combines state-of-the-art technology with sustainable regional development to support the circular carbon economy. We call our approach Integrated Biomass and Carbon Management. And this is how it works. 
There are multiple sources of biomass, whether in urban or rural environments. The raw materials must be prepared prior to carbonization. Some just decaying, but how is this bale then converted into energy? First, the silage is dissolved in warm water. Subsequent dewatering creates a high energy silage fluid, which is then fed into the biogas plant. Biogas can be converted into electricity and heat in the cogeneration plant, CHP. The press cake, the solid components of the silage, is dried with waste heat from the CHP. Now the press cake is ready for carbonization, a process called pyrolysis. This pyrolysis plant is built in Baden-Baden, Germany. At 700 degrees in the reactor, the raw materials become carbonized. By adding steam, the carbon is converted into activated charcoal. In addition, the plant creates thermal energy, which can be used to dry new raw materials. There are a multitude of different products that can be produced from this carbon. Here in Baden-Baden, the biochar is used for the purification of effluent. It also can be used, for example, as a raw material for cosmetics or in the process of producing pharmaceuticals. The circular carbon economy is a seedbed for innovators and creative startups. In Germany, students from the Master of Entrepreneurship at the University Duisburg-Essen are already designing new products and services based on biochar feedstock. The strategy replaces fossil coal with carbon derived from renewable sources and can be used to clean water and soils and improve the efficiency of smell and pollutant reduction. This material can also serve as carbon sinks and promote carbon sequestration. There is a huge potential for alternative carbon products, however, we also predict a growing demand for advice, support and management services. These will help to develop the collection, processing and conversion of waste biomasses into carbon products, the operating of regional conversion plants and the management of regional and European product, value and supply chains. Integrated biomass management is the starting point for sustainable regional development. Ten years ago, we started developing our integrated biomass management system. And our aim was to achieve utmost efficiency while converting bio-waste into energy. In the course of our work, we came across the idea to convert these wastes into activated charcoal because we will need it anyway as feedstock in our innovative wastewater treatment concept. Also in rural areas, the production of plant coal can create new income sources and promote regional development. There are a number of areas uh, of agricultural activity that could benefit from the use of biochar. There are lots of natural processes um, that could be enhanced by it and the big advantage is that it is a material that could be produced locally with very low impacts on climate change. So the potential for the circular carbon economy in our region are extensive. We can rebuild our population by engaging with this economic and this environmental opportunity. We can continue to have a population, we can build in resilience. Uh, we can also employ uh, either sides of our population, our young people and our elder people to service this economy. And in turn, we will be able to continue to service the geography, which is our sea geography on the Western shore on behalf of Ireland and on behalf of the rest of Europe. the research vision we have in the background. Our network has developed our approach uh, since 2008 and we believe now after four projects uh, in research and development uh, that uh, the circular carbon economy has developed into a very important economic, ecological and social sector and that the management approach that we have developed therein, so uh, the integrated carbon and biomass management plays an important role for regional development and for interregional development. Especially the former Northwest European coal areas, but also disadvantaged rural areas, can become pioneer regions for an integrated biomass and carbon management. My vision, uh, 
I have is actually that we can turn a worthless organic matter we have in all landscapes in Germany and everywhere in Europe and even outside of course into a valuable product which helps to solve a significant societal which is environmental ecological financial and social problems at once and simultaneously that's my hope and my vision yeah Okay, so that was just a, a brief overview of the processes involved. Now for TreeC, uh, the main focus for the TreeC project is to promote innovation and business development in the circular carbon economy. Now there are many different terms that you may hear applied such as charcoal, activated carbon, biochar, biocarbon or even renewable carbon. Uh, personally, I tend to use either biochar or just char. Uh, so there's three main elements central to the project. Uh, firstly, product development activities. So these will uh, occur in uh, regional circular carbon hubs. There are plans for about seven hubs in total spread out across the six countries, where the idea is to provide access to expertise and knowledge, as well as technical support, which will extend across the different countries. Uh, some of the hubs will be situated in existing locations, such as the, the farm at Molokai in Wales, which Colin will discuss a little later on. We'll also have some higher education incubators in the universities. Um, so it's likely that the hub in Ireland will remain largely in digital form while COVID continues. Uh, many of our stakeholders also happen to be spread out all across the country, but uh, once the public health situation allows it, uh, we will look to be able to meet up on a regular basis. In terms of expertise here in Ireland, we have no shortage of talent. Um, to choose from, and we've already begun engaging, engaging with many of, of them and getting them on board for the project. Of some of the activities which are planned for the hubs, it is hoped to be able to inform on an approach to biomass and carbon management through our workshops, uh, putting producers in touch with potential clients or product developers, as well as working with stakeholders related to the harvesting, collection and conversion of biomass. So next, uh, product feedstock quality will be the mainstay of a, a CC lab. We're aiming to have a, a central lab based in Germany with plans for a number of satellite labs uh, where the focus will be on ensuring uh, quality with plans to develop a, a quality assurance label. Uh, however, we're also looking forward to engaging with uh, analytical companies a bit closer to home once the project evolves. And then finally, to connect them all, there will be an overarching umbrella network called CCNet, uh, which aims to connect stakeholders, providing training, CPD, marketing advice, access to investor platforms, uh, just some of the, the, the planned development activities. Now, just in terms of the Irish situation, uh, it's a question we get asked more than once, uh, what level of production has taken place in Ireland in terms of biochar? Uh, it cropped up a few times during the redirect project. And so it's great to be able to announce that we have at least three Irish based producers cap capable of producing tonnage of biochar per week. So they are Arigna Biofuels, and we'll hear from Robert a little later on. Then we have David Robinson and his team with Origin Biochar based in the north. And then we also have Morris and the team at Greenbelt Biochar. Uh, so all three are up and running and indeed open to inquiries. In terms of technology providers, we have Eddie and the team at Heat Systems, who specialize in rotary kilns and activated carbon. We also have Woodco and their Empire Carbonizer, which is a, a unit I'm looking forward to seeing in, in action. And then in terms of analysis, we have the team in Salignus Biomass Analysis, who are now offering uh, biochar testing services. There's also a number of recent and ongoing R&D project, uh, projects researching the potential for bio-based products and energy carriers. So we have Bernard from the, the Biochar Cooperative, uh, who's working with Premier Green Energy, and they're in the process of developing a mobile pyrolysis unit as part of a European Innovation Partner Programme. And then, of course, we have activities and projects, both past and present, at a number of our higher education institutes. 
So uh, apologies if you're not on that list and you should be, uh, do get in touch uh, and we'll, we'll discuss further. So at the heart of the project is the idea of the integrated biomass and carbon management system, uh, allowing management techniques to divert materials that might not otherwise be used and using them as a feedstock for biochar production. But this biochar is then used for the development of our biochar based products as our services. So across the six countries involved, uh, we have different biomass substrates uh, available in different quantities and the means by which they be can, can be converted or even collected differ depending on the, the situation on the ground. But broadly speaking, uh, they can be divided into three categories. So first is grassy fibrous material. But here you're talking about any grassy material, uh, rushes, bracken, uh, mullinia, leaf litter, and even problematic species such as Japanese knotweed, which is something that our Belgian partners are looking at. Uh, next up is woody biomass, which is something Ireland has plenty of. Uh, so here we can include the likes of forestry or arboreal residue, softwood or hardwood, and again, even problematic species uh, such as uh, rhododendron or even gorse. Uh, in some of our partner regions, they actually make use of roadside hedge cuttings uh, by using specialist machinery capable of collection during the cutting process. And then finally, uh, food waste biomass. So here you're talking about the likes of your brown bin waste, which will probably need feeding through the IFBB process before, they, uh, before it, it gets carbonized. But other food processing waste, such as fruit stones or olive pits, uh, won't. Now, for the purpose of the project, we're looking at five defined lines of product development, but there's obviously uh, plenty of scope to explore outside of these areas. So first is the cleaning of wastewater. Uh, as you saw, Redirect was designed with wastewater treatment in mind. It was aimed at the removal of farmer residues uh, from water prior to discharge to environment. However, uh, many other industrial sectors could potentially benefit from regionally produced filtration medium. Perhaps there's also a potential there for nutrient recovery. Uh, and then there's also cases to be made for the treatment of domestic wastewater through biochar, which has been incorporated into constructed wetlands or even percolation areas. There's also a good deal of potential for improving groundwater uh, water quality by integrating char into suds and swales uh, to catch pollutants coming from road runoff. Uh, and also potential for applications designed at uh, reducing eutrophication incidence in uh, surface water water bodies. Uh, the next product category we're hoping to investigate is char-based products uh, for the treatment of effluents and odors. So that could include the removal of hydrogen sulfide from biogas, for instance. Uh, there's already a wide range of carbon-based odor control units and filtration products available for both industrial and domestic use. So these could be anything from septic tank vent pipe filters to prevent unwanted summertime smells to uh, passive odor control units for drains, vents and stacks. There's also more specialist products which are tasked with not just removing odor but specific flue gases such as mercury. Um, currently many of these products contain fossil carbon as their filtration medium but being able to develop bio-based substitutions is a good fit for the bioeconomy. So the next of the five product categories is broadly defined as being uh, additives for the animal bedding or litter sector. Uh, there are plenty of commercial, uh, commercially available products for the domestic animal market where odor from indoor toilet use can be problematic. Plenty of cat litter type products, which can also be used for other small animals, rabbits and poultry and reptiles. Uh, they're often made in pellet form by mixing activated carbon with cornstarch. Uh, the use of biochar blended uh, with other biomass as a bedding material for horses is something that's already takes place in other countries such as Germany. Um, it can have added benefits of reducing odour and making a better quality compost uh, and improving hygienic conditions in the stable. The same with adding biochar to the floor of poultry units and our Welsh partners in particular would have a keen interest in this because they're based in a, an area deemed nitrate vulnerable and there's quite a large uh, substantial poultry industry. So it's one they'll be looking at. Um, and another area for targeted for product development and investigation is the idea of slurry additives. So 
depending on the desired outcome, it may require a specific type of char made from certain types of biomass. For instance, um, should you wish to reduce fugitive emissions arising from slurry tanks, uh, many have reported success with the layer of uh, char being scattered on top. This will obviously increase the, the carbon content of any uh, uh, anything, any slurry that gets land spread, and it's also hoped that it will aid in reducing runoff and emissions following the spreading. Then another char may prove beneficial in boosting uh, biogas or biomethane yields when added in the right dosage to anaerobic digestion tanks. And this is certainly an area we'd like to, exp uh, we're, we're, we're keen to explore further. Oops. I'm gone, but pardon me. Um, so where was I? Sorry there now. Uh, uh, so yeah, so the final product, the final product line we're looking at is the area of biochar-based uh, soil additives or amendments. So uh, given that it has a, a multitude of potential benefits, uh, ranging from peat replacement, increased carbon content, soil remediation, uh, nutrient and moisture retention, or providing uh, beneficial habitats for microbes, uh, it, it's easy to see why it's increasingly becoming uh, accepted as a useful medium, whether it's by hobby gardeners or landscapers, uh, local authorities, uh, even professional horticulturists and plant nurseries. Uh, there's a range of companies operating across the globe who have biochar-based soil additives. Uh, for example, we have in the UK, we have Carbon Gold who sell a range of, bl and bl of blends and products uh, for different applications uh, containing fungi, uh, seaweed and worm casts. Also in the UK are Terrafix soil, solu soil, solu soil solutions. So they're a company that provide biochar based services, uh, including land remediation uh, and revegetation, hydro seeding and embankment stabilization. Uh, in the States, we have the company Artichar and they're providing a range of uh, biochar based products in both solid and liquid form. And then last, but by no means least, we have Ireland's own uh, ProBioCarbon. So Dr. Karen O'Hanlon uh, has developed her plant feed range using her blend of bacteria that she cultures in the nuts and coats onto biochar made in Roscommon by Robert and the team at Arigna. Uh, so those are the five defined product lines we're looking to see developed as part of the Tree Seed project. Uh, obviously within those five different categories, there's many different potential products that could be developed. So we're, we're aiming at assisting the development of such products uh, through the, the cooperation and successful rollout of our hubs, uh, the lab and the network. Um, so if you have an idea for, or a need even, for a biochar based product or service that isn't readily available, we'd love to hear from you. Perhaps you might have a, a biomass dream uh, that you'd like to see tested for suitability. Uh, or perhaps you might have an idea for harvesting or processing equipment and are interested in exploring it further. Uh, so not all biochar needs to be made in large scale facilities, uh, many of us are producing it on a, on a farm le level, and again this is an area we'd be keen to explore further, so do get in touch. Uh, perhaps you have a, a green waste processing facility and would be interested in exploring an I IFBB site, do get in touch as I say. Um, so there are many potential opportunities for collaboration and development uh, outside of the five defined product lines, uh, I'll just draw your attention to a few of the, the following. So uh, the biofertilizer market, uh, this will no doubt be a gr growth sector uh, alongside the European drive towards a circular economy. So we're looking forward to connecting and sharing with initiatives such as the Irish Nutrient Sustainability Platform, particularly in light of the work that's been done uh, to allow biochar based biofertilizers onto the European market uh, under the fertilizing Pro products regulations, which are due to come into force by 2022. Then there is also the area of using biochar as a base for construction aggregate uh, for buildings and indeed for uh, asphalt or tarmac, which sequester carbon in the process. And there's companies uh, in Germany and Austria that are looking at that at the moment. And then there are startup companies such as Made of Air in Germany who are working on biochar based construction materials and indeed thermoplastics. Then we have the likes of companies such as Carbofex in Finland who are providing carbon negative district heating combined with biochar production, but they're also trading CO2 removal certificates on the, the Puro Earth platform, uh, which allows companies like Shopify and Stripe to purchase verifiable carbon sinks. 
Char can obviously be used as a fuel source for both domestic and industrial heating. And there's projects in Canada who are looking to reduce the carbon footprint in steel production by using biochar as a fuel source. And then finally, of course, there's also potential in using biochar as an animal feed additive. Um, and this is one that a number of our stakeholders have a particular interest in. Okay, and finally, given that it's a bioeconomy week, it's worth highlighting the degree of overlap between the circular carbon economy and the bioeconomy. So, as is the case with Baden Baden, the practice of potentially co locating facilities makes an awful lot of sense. So, it allows for increased efficiency in terms of bioenergy use and infrastructure use. But it's also worth remembering that the IPCC has highlighted biochar production as being a promising negative emissions technology. So this kind of thinking has slowly begun to make its way into regional policy objectives, including the pictured uh, and recently published Regional Spatial and Economic, Economic Strategy, or the RECESS, uh, which is produced by the Northern and Western Regional Assembly. So you'll see there, it's nice to see the idea of pyrogenic carbon capture and storage gain recognition uh, alongside the areas of biorefinery hubs, which are capable of valorizing multi-feedstocks. Now, while the investigation of potential uh, other pyrolysis products such as bio oil or wood vinegar are outside the scope of the Tree C project, it is an area that has seen uh, promise and research all over the world. Uh, so hopefully we'll see these sectors expand and develop in the coming months and years. So that's my bit done. Uh, should you wish to find out more or to get involved, please do get in touch. That's uh, my email address. You'll find my contact information on the website as well. Uh, thanks for listening, and over to you, Sean. That's great. Um, thanks That's very great. much, Stephen, for your presentation um, this morning um, and for just giving us a brief overview of what's involved in the uh, 3C project. Um, a number of questions are coming in, um, and we encourage you to post your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen and we will endeavour to answer as many of your questions as possible as part of the panel discussion and Q&A um, at the end of our presentations. Um, our next presenter this morning is all the way from Wales. Um, Colin Keyes has 25 years experience as a senior manager um, or director in various organisations in Wales, including small SMEs involved in recycling, renewable energy and environmental uh, conservation. He is director of the um, uh, Consortium um, Moloki CYF overseeing multiple project developments on farm Moloki. So Moloki is now home to the IFBB biomass farm scale plant plus biochar retort to which will add which will be added a renewable energy system including solar PV, wind turbine and battery storage with intelligent uh, management supplying the different businesses on the farm via a microgrid. There's also a farm shop and cafe, a large group of community allotments for vegetable growing, a market garden, and education center and small business workshops. The site also links several local food businesses and a group of eight other sheep and cattle farmers with the holding, land holding totaling uh, 1,750 hectares. So Colin, um, thanks very much for joining us. Um, we worked closely with you as part of the project team on the 3C project and prior to this, uh, on the redirect project and we're looking forward this morning to hearing your presentation where you'll just outline to us the 3C project on a farm scale and what you're doing in Wales as part of the project to uh, deliver on some of the objectives which Stephen has outlined as part of his presentation. So I now hand over to you Colin to take us through your presentation and thanks again for joining us this morning. Thank you very much Sean, um, hope you can hear me okay, good morning to everybody. Um, I'm going to go through my presentation uh, for the benefit of those of you who are not familiar with Farm Moila Key and... Colin, uh, you just need to share your slides. Um, yep. Sorry, whenever you get a chance. Um, uh, just bear with me. Uh, so we'll just go to... So to share... Uh, it's coming up there now and that's great and if you can go to the presentation mode um, slideshow yeah that's great thanks Colin that's great thanks very much um, 
Yep. Um, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with the, the backstory of uh, Farm Oil Key of our, our small organization, I'm going to do a, a brief recap um, on uh, how we arrived at where we are today, um, how we got involved in the world of um, biomass resource management, um, and how we ended up joining a number of European partners uh, on this journey towards creating additional sustainable value for uh, rural communities that are under a wide range of pressures. So um, what is Farm Moiler Key? It was originally part of the Penryn estate in, in North Wales um, and operated as an upland sheep farm, traditional upland sheep farm, uh, until the end of 2001. And uh, some of you may recall in 2001, we had a major outbreak of foot and mouth disease, which hits the livestock industry very hard indeed. Um, at the end of that year, the tenant decided that she'd had enough and decided to give up. And there was the uh, risk that the farm would be purchased and developed um, as, a, as a very large touring caravan site. So several neighbors got together, bought it, and then set up um, a social enterprise, which local people could buy shares in to run the farm as an environmental uh, conservation and education centre. Um, the farm ran very successfully under that mode for about 10 years, but then there was a shift in, in funding policy which moved funding away from training courses uh, run by third sector organisations, um, and the organisation started to struggle a little bit. Um, so they were introduced to uh, a fellow social enterprise for which I was working at the time, based in Mid Wales, about 150 kilometers south of, uh, of Moylucky. Um, and uh, this was Cum Harry Land Trust, a well-established uh, social enterprise, um, having run a very large in vessel composter, small AD plant, community allotments, etc., cetera. Um, and had, its own aspirations to take over a community farm in Mid Wales, uh, which unfortunately didn't come to fruition. So we had an organisation with skills and capacity uh, looking for a farm project and a farm project that was starting to struggle and looking for additional capacity. So the two organisations came together. Um, Cum Harry started to manage the farm uh, and the original intention was for it to purchase the freehold uh, of the uh, full 300 acres uh, and then to sublet it to a range of other organisations uh, and it was going to be the platform for a number of interesting projects looking at renewable energy, food production, um, biomass processing etc. Uh, unfortunately um, things didn't quite go that smoothly but in 2015, we had a, a visioning session to try and um, describe what the eventual uh, appearance of the farm that we wanted was going to look like. And we came up with this um, expression of all the different activities. It's been described as the uh, food, water, energy nexus. The idea of the fact that the farm could act uh, as almost a self-sufficient entity, um, but to do so in a way which related directly to the communities around it, particularly the farming community. So it wasn't just going to be a showcase, uh, which uh, looked at, and people looked at, if you like, behind a plate glass, it was going to be very much a living, breathing entity that people could interact with and see that these processes that we wanted to introduce were mainstream. Um, unfortunately, uh, the um, uh, the situation changed for both the owning organisation and the fact that um, the land was designated by the Welsh Government as a site of special scientific interest, which affected its value. And due to a range of circumstances, Cum Harry was unable to go through with its um, purchase of the whole site. So instead it became part of a consortium. Um, and this involved uh, changing the relationship between people who had planned to be our tenants, um, but instead we became uh, equal partners. Now, it's quite interesting because we decided not to use a conventional mechanism um, 
around setting up a company and people putting in money and taking shares. This is where each of the partners actually bought the piece of land or the building or, or the plot that they were sitting on with their own money. Uh, and that the size of the purchase varied tremendously from about sort of 5,000 pounds for a small block of woodland up to 150,000 pounds in some cases. Um, but nevertheless, we came together as 10 equal partners um, and there was uh, an, an understanding that in order for this to work, people had to collaborate on a very equal basis and a respectful basis. Otherwise, the thing wasn't going to work. Uh, there were lots of prophets of doom saying that um, it couldn't possibly work. People couldn't work together like this. It would be fighting like cats in a sack. But we've confounded our critics and uh, well, with, a, with a, one or two little um, uh, involved discussions, shall we say. Uh, nonetheless, we've uh, survived and prospered very well. So the consortium bought the farm in December 2018 and since then we've been making rapid progress. So the consortium company, online Moiler Key Kevin Gedig, which in Welsh means forward Moiler Key, um, we have as Sean has uh, said, we've got a number of activities that take place on the farm and each of the partners invests their own money in developing what they do. But we use the consortium company as a forum for um, uh, collaboration, for problem solving, for looking at the opportunities to share resources and work together. And this gives you an idea of what the farm now looks like. Uh, for those of you involved in agriculture, uh, this created quite a nightmare when it came to dealing with the Welsh Government over payment of farming subsidies because the Welsh Government did not want to deal with 10 different landowners where you had one farming tenant. So as with many of the other things, it took a lot of creative lateral thinking um, to think about how we were going to construct the bilateral legal relationships to make this all work together. But after 18 months of working on it, we managed to achieve what we think is quite a groundbreaking package and it does seem to work. So how do we get involved in, in the biomass side of things? Well, originally, as, as, as Stephen um, has, has explained, uh, the University of Kassel started with uh, a project called Prograss, uh, looking at identifying surplus biomass and low value biomass resources across Northwest Europe and looking at things that could be done with them. Um, they developed the IFBB process uh, and uh, set up um, a mobile demonstrator plant which uh, toured around various parts of Northwest Europe, it visited Aberystwyth University. Uh, and whilst it was there, um, one of the uh, one of our uh, former colleagues there then developed a relationship with um, a forestry contractor in Scotland who had a large amount of surplus biomass from wetland reserves they were managing and wanted something to do with it. So they took advantage of a separate fund of money from the UK government uh, for three uh, wetland sites owned by the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. And they developed a containerized version of the IFBB process, which sat in the middle of the Inch Marshes Reserve up in the Cairngorms. Um, Following on from Prograss, the next project was Combine, and that identified potential sites and business cases for IFBB across Northwest Europe at a variety of scales, from small local scale plants uh, up to full scale city scale plants, as you've seen, for example, in the video about Baden Baden. And at the culmination of that was to prepare a series of pre investment plans um, to make the business case and make each of these opportunities investable. We then moved on to redirect where we actually had to build and invest in these uh, plants. And this is where um, we decided to use Farm Moiler Key as the location for the farm scale plant because it was complementary to all the other activities there. It wasn't uh, a standalone operation in the terms of it being in isolation. Uh, the activities were designed to integrate. Uh, you've also seen how at the Baden Baden site they added the uh, activated charcoal pyrolysis unit, um, which was a large scale development that added on to their pre existing IFBB plant. And then we move on to 3C, which, as we'll see in a minute, starts to approach um, the problem from the opposite end, which is looking at the market, looking at potential products, and seeing how they could be connected to 
the um, upscaling of the production capacity across the region. So we were well aware that we had a lot of biomass. University of Bangor provided us with a lot of interpretation of satellite data, which we've got actually in great detail on the land surface in Wales. Uh, they're able to identify the information for us by vegetation type, um, uh, by the density of it, and it will actually go down to 10 meter square. So very, very detailed information. This is publicly available information. Um, and it gave us an idea of what grew where and how accessible it was. And we're here up in the, the northwest corner of Wales, um, and it's a, a mountainous region, Snowdonia. So we've got quite a lot of um, available low, low value biomass uh, close to us. In 2017, um, an opportunity arose. We'd been thinking that we had to design and build our own uh, version of the IFBB plant in Wales. Um, and uh, we got a phone call out of the blue from Jonathan Walker up in AMW in Scotland and said, um, our planning permission has been revoked. You know the plant we've got in Scotland, would you like it? So of course we weren't going to look a, a gift horse in the mouth, so we said, yes, please. And therefore, a year later, we actually transported the whole plant, lock, stock and barrel, um, down from Scotland to set it up on, a, on our site uh, at Farm Moiler Quay. Um, it's quite interesting. It was a lovely clear November day. The contractors were supposed to deliver the plant at nine o'clock in the morning. They turned up at half past four uh, in the evening when it was getting dark, which made unloading this kit extremely interesting. Uh, we've gone through the process of designing the site and exactly how we wanted things, but unfortunately, due to the effects of Brexit and the uncertainty about whether or not we would be able to draw down our funding, nobody wanted to lend Cum Harry any money to build it. So it was a very stop-start process of actually trying to get friends and supporters to lend us a bit of money, completing a bit of the work, and then waiting again to take it further. But this year, at long last, we managed to complete our building. Um, and the last job I've got to do now, the door's on, is, is now move the sign across to <laughs> the front of the new building uh, to explain to people what it's about. Um, as I said, it's about integrating onto the farm with the other processes that are going on. We have a renewable energy system, which we're developing, involving a small wind turbine, roof mounted and ground mounted solar PV, battery storage, and um, an intelligent management system. And the plan is to link this to the standby biodiesel generator and the biogas CHP that's connected to the IFBB plant. So we have a multi-source system uh, that can generate in different modes, can store electricity and can provide power for different loads for different users on the farm uh, in a changing pattern. So, the, the, the key point about what we're trying to do is that we have got a production facility that can make a range of products um, from the biomass that we put in. So we can put in, for example, solid fuel briquettes uh, made from wood chip and the pressed fibres that come in from the green material. Uh, the output of the anaerobic digester, we can concentrate that and produce a, a liquid organic fertiliser. Uh, the press cake, which is the uh, demineralized uh, material um, from the IFBB plant, can make a range of fiber based products. And of course, post pyrolysis, we've got the ability to make a range of things from, for example, a, a bio coal, if you're running the process at a low temperature, up to um, a biochar um, for uh, blending with other uh, materials. Now, as we've all seen, we've faced a lot of challenges which have impacted the way that our customer base, as we thought we knew them, has thought about what we do and has approached the products that we hope to offer to them. In a farming community, uh, especially livestock farming, they're coming under a lot of pressure with a lot of negative press about the uh, aspects of intensive farming. Uh, we have, of course, Brexit, which is a complete wild card, which has created massive uncertainty. Um, especially around what the regulatory framework is going to be. Uh, and this year, of course, we've had coronavirus, which has impacted us with travel restrictions and is causing a lot of economic damage. So how do we turn um, a non-viable small farm uh, into something that supports our farming community around us? Uh, well, we took a view early on to develop as a rural enterprise hub. We've put a mixture of projects together 
Most importantly, we have a farm shop and a food business outlet. Um, this means that we can sell direct to our public, so we're not selling large scale um, for supply contracts and accepting a low bulk price. We can charge retail prices uh, and that additional margin makes a smaller scale operation much more likely to be able to succeed. Um, we share resources, skills, knowledge with partners in our local area and across Wales. Um, and we are looking to create local circular economic loops and capture the, the local pound and keep it in our local community as long as possible. So as Steve mentioned, there's a number of products that we are looking to make. Um, we have a source of base compost, which we can uh, blend with biochar and with other materials. So what we're looking at at the moment is what is already out there. What are our customers that come to our farm shop already buying and in addition to the um the hobby gardening um and uh, smallholder market uh, we've also got a lot of people who are interested in pet products a variety of other things that um barbecue charcoal etc that they're already buying from at the supermarkets and diy stores and the interest in this has actually grown since the coronavirus lockdown. We've had a huge increase in visitors to our, our farm shop because we are on the middle, in the middle of a farm. People can exercise and walk out in the fresh air. They can buy a takeaway coffee and some food from us and sit outside and eat it. Um, and they can um, uh, browse in the shop uh, and then uh, make their purchases uh, in a much more relaxed manner where they don't feel confined, as some people are saying. Uh, and anxious when visiting supermarkets. Uh, we've also networked with a lot of our other business micro food producers. This is the community uh, electric car um, and the uh, farm acts as a food concentration hub. So all the local producers bring their food and non-food products to us. Um, we have an online purchasing system. So everyone puts their order in on sun by Sunday night. The orders are collated on the Thursday morning and then we have a local delivery service uh, via the electric car, with um, uh, driven by volunteers, um, to all the households in the area. And, and again, this has grown in popularity dramatically. Uh, and the range of local producers that are using the farm as a hub has, is also being added to on a weekly basis. In terms of 3C, um, our role is to act as a small scale hub. So we have a former agricultural building, um, uh, an old cow shed, which we're going to convert into three or maybe four micro incubator units for entrepreneurs, uh, innovators and startups. Um, we will link with our two uh, Welsh partners, which is IBERS, which is the um, Grassland Research Institute, the Aberystwyth University, uh, and also the 7Y Energy Agency. Uh, to provide um, an exchange of information and technical resources for people who make inquiries with us as to what we want to do, or what they want to do, whether they want to solve a problem using biochar or whether or not they've got an idea to make a product. Um, we will be supplied with raw material, probably from Germany to start with, and we can give them the opportunity to make a prototype product and to test market it on our local community through our on-site retail outlet and the online shopping outlet and if that's successful we can then use our on-site biomass plant to see if we can produce the same quality of base material for them from local biomass rather than just using imported biochar as the basis of their product. Um, the exploration of the market here is something that we're, we're doing at the moment. As Stephen has said, it's very much a desktop um, uh, exercise at the moment because we are restricted um, by COVID. But we are looking at raising awareness of the potential of biochar uh, with partner organisations uh, across our area in North Wales. Um, and we are already detecting that there's a great interest in this because the focus on on home, on countryside, on quality of food and quality of life, that uh, the COVID pandemic has stimulated. is starting to make our customers much more engaged um, with what they're buying and how it is produced. So that's where we see ourselves heading over the next few months. 
Um, and I think that's it for now. So thank you very much indeed, Sean. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions for things that I might have missed. That's great. Um, thanks very much, Colin, for your presentation. And um, as you said, there are a number of questions coming in. Um, we'd ask all, for all attendees to continue to log your questions through the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. Uh, thanks very much, um, Colin, for your presentation uh, and for joining us this morning. And I think you clearly um, have articulated the potential which exists um, in, I suppose, rural Wales in your case, but also in rural Ireland for the development of uh, the circular economy and the circular carbon economy. Um, and I know that as part of the project, the redirect project, um, we visited um, and some of our presenters this morning visited your farm in Molokhi last September and uh, certainly it has huge potential and we look we wish you the best of luck in developing um, the concepts which you speak about as part of the presentation this morning and we do indeed look forward to returning um, at some point as part of the project and it's great to see the development which has happened since we were there with your development of your of your facilities and your um, infrastructure on the farm. Um, our next presenter this morning and our final formal presentation of the morning um, comes from Dr. Robert Johnson. Uh, Robert um, joined Arigna Biofuels in 2010 as the R&D manager uh, while completing a PhD in thermal, biomass thermal conversion at the Energy Research Institute at the University of Leeds. Uh, previous this, he qualified in a first class honours degree in chemistry from um, Huddersfield University has over 27 years industrial experience in research, pharmaceutical and various manufacturing environments and is passionate about the potential of renewable carbon to help solve um, the climate crisis. Um, and Robert this morning will present to us about pioneering biochar uh, product development in Ireland and um, how his material that he produces in County Roscommon can be utilised in terms of product development. So Robert, um, we're delighted to have you join us this morning and for your active participation in the Redirect project and indeed look forward to working with you further on this project. So I'll hand over to you, Robert, um, to take us through your presentation. Uh, just before you begin, um, at the end of your presentation, then we will, uh, I'll have a short um, discussion with Morris, uh, our Erbia Vice President uh, on this whole area. And then we will go to a panel discussion where we can take and answer your questions and take feedback from the panel on various topics raised by you, the attendees. So Robert, over to you and thanks again for joining us. Good. Thanks, Sean. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you again to uh, Stephen and Teresa as well for uh, including me in the, the Triple C project. I will share my screen just now. Yeah, that one there. And there we go. How's that? Uh, it hasn't come up yet now, Robert. Has uh, it not? No. no. Oh. Just have to... Hang on a sec. Share. Oh. Now it's sharing, so. Okay, how's that? <laughs> uh, I, I'm gonna talk today, um, a little bit today, about the, um, the carbon history of Arigna Fuels. Uh, we start at the coal mine and we're gonna move through the years to where we are today. Uh, that, takes, that takes me to the pyrolysis process in a little bit more detail. Um, next is our commitment to kind of R&D of biomass and biomass derived solid fuels and char and their environmental benefits when compared to existing fuels in the market. Uh, last but not least are the challenges facing the emerging bio biochar industry in Ireland, both from a market and a policy perspective. This is effectively the start of the Rigna fuels and the longest running carbon extraction industry locally. Uh, coal mining in the area started in the 1700s and continued commercially till 1990 when the mines were closed. This provided coal for the local power station and other commercial customers. There were open cast sites and cutting mining at the side of the hill, uh, following the coal seams at Lane Strata across the hillside. On the site of the cutting mine uh, up the hill from us, there's now the Arigna Mining Experience and Visitor Centre. Uh, where you can be taken on a tour underground by an ex-miner. I'd recommend definitely having a visit if you haven't done it already. Uh, I'm not getting paid for this, but it's a few minutes up the road from us and it's very highly rated on TripAdvisor if that's your go-to source of info. 
Arrhythmia Fuels was founded in 1990 by the late Brendan Layden. We're still family owned and we're run by Brendan's sons, who are Brendan, Peter and David. Uh, Arrhythmia Fuels in its current configuration employs 44 full-time members of staff, approximately 200 directly, uh, indirectly employed. So we're talking about hauliers and merchants, etc. Um, we produce at the moment up to 60,000 tonnes a year of solid fuels for the domestic market. These are low sulphur, very low smoke and crucially totally compliant with the smokeless fuel directive in Ireland and the UK. We know that figuratively the writing is on the wall for the fossil fuel industry. So with the help of Enterprise Ireland and recently the Western Development Commission, we're investing heavily in technology, plant equipment and research and, research and development to take uh, Rigna Biofuels to the forefront of biomass thermal processing, both nationally and globally. We believe both biofuels and biochar have a significant part to play in a low carbon economy future as a fossil fuel replacement, but there's still hurdles to overcome. In terms of the biomass thermal conversion that we've perfected at Arigna Biofuels, we're using a relatively low temperature pyrolysis technology. The characterization is slow pyrolysis because we have a very, very controlled temperature gradient of under 10 degrees per, to, per 10 degrees centigrade per minute he, of heating. Uh, we can make, we can put over process all, all, the whole part of this was to make a, a wide, uh, to process a whole wide range of feedstocks to make fuels initially, but carbon from anything up to 55 to 85%. Uh, this is a fairly simplified schematic of the process that we use. We indirectly heat the biomass using thermal oil and we use a screw auger configuration. Uh, biomass is, goes in, enters, it's been preheated and dried at 200 degrees and we heat it up to over, when it starts reaching 200 degrees or above, we start to generate gases. Uh, these are taken off and combusted in a high temperature in a thermal oxidizer, which heats the thermal oil, which then provides additional heat for the process. At a certain point, the process becomes autothermal and drives itself with no additional heat input. Uh, the difference between the biochar grids that we offer are related to the autothermal point and managing that reaction. The fuel production that process that we do is around 94% thermally efficient for the torrified for the fuel processes, but we haven't got figures for the biochar grids as yet. So this is the plant. This is our future and it's taken about 10 years to get to where we are today uh, with a significant investment of about 2 million euros. It's the, it consists of a, a gas boiler, a dryer, reactor, cooler and a crusher, a thermal oxidizer and a safety flare. We can run this plant up to 450 degrees and we've made some very, very high, uh, interesting high carbon materials, up to 85% carbon for just from this plant. Here's a few figures relating to the, the pyrolysis plant operation. Throughput is largely governed by the products and by the, the feedstock and the, um, the moisture content. Um, high carbon biochars that we make are, are much lighter so in terms of tonnage, we would be operating at the low end of the scale, uh, around about half a ton an hour, roughly. Um, but we can go up to one and a half tons an hour when we're making fuel products. The whole idea of the pyrolysis process is it's, it's, it's oxygen-free and we monitor that to make sure obviously that's, there's no oxygen gets in as we get combustion. Um, and we have a two-stage process. It's pre-dried in one area and then it's reacted in the pyrolysis machine. This is a little video of uh, our feedstock coming in. I'll just play it very briefly for you.
Uh, yeah, that's um, a short video of the, the latest bulk delivery of olive stones that we came into Sligo Port and they were offloaded last week. Uh, there were 2,000 tonnes on this shipment, which will produce about 1,500 tonnes of biomass briquettes for fuel, or we could make maybe 800 tonnes of high carbon biochar. Um, there are obviously environmental benefits of, of making torrefied fuels or pyrolyzed fuels, that's why we're doing it. Um, we, we've made a concerted effort not to use biomass products that are causing issues in other parts of the world. We have a very, very tight process control, which means we can adapt to a variety of feedstocks. Um, our plant was designed from the outset to be as flexible as possible and for, to, to produce higher carbon products for the purpose of domestic fuels. Um, but we as a company, sorry, um, agricultural residues we're using at the moment um, are from food production and they're favored because the separation has to be done anyway. Um, the value of the byproducts is far less than the value of the food. So it's unlikely that the crops would be grown solely for the purpose of fuel. Um, we saw from the Mediterranean where there are numerous growers and processors and we're continuing the traditions of farmers in that region. Um, the, one of the largest environmental benefits from all of this is, the, um, is carbon sequestration. Um, it's, a, it's in the region of 2.5 to 3 tonnes of CO2 per tonne of biochar produced. Uh, and there are hundreds of other cascade benefits from, from biochar. Um, this is a company that's already making biochar and selling biochar up in, um, in Finland, Carboflex. And what they do is they have a voluntary system of, of carbon dioxide capture. So as you can see in the top right corner, um, they are at the moment they're charging 61 euros 80 per ton uh, of material which is far greater at the moment than the the carbon tax currently implemented on coal uh, they're audited externally uh, during it for a life cycle analysis to make sure that they that the what they have for sale is higher uh, in it, it, it sequests the right amount of carbon and I think they're ordered to, to have the net negativity, so the carbon negative to 3.11 tonnes of CO2 per unit that they sell. Um, this is a non-exhaustive list of our current research areas for biochar applications, and it covers a, a, a wide, very, very wide range of potential areas. Uh, we've already conducted bench trials for anaerobic digestion additives. We've seen increased biogas yields reported by an independent uh, laboratory for dairy sludge. Uh, in terms of soil amendment, we're partnered with a, a company previously mentioned called ProBioCarbon, and I believe uh, Karen is on the, on the, uh, on the call at the moment, um, who I'll give, we'll talk a little bit about that later, but, and I'll give her contact details as well in case this is of interest. But we have a preferred supplier in agreement in place, so any Queries about soil amendment would obviously go through her. We've provided su supplied biochar to a farm recently to see what the nitrogen and ammonia uptake is by the char and the subsequent re reduction of gas emissions, gaseous emissions. The ultimate aim for them was to preserve as much nitrogen for use as a fertilizer and reduce farm ammonia emissions. Um, we'd obviously talk about carbon sequestration. There's a huge potential area for this, for the biochar industry in Ireland. Um, construction, building materials in concrete as screed coatings and as uh, for road or pavement additives. Um, even relatively small additions of biochar to any of these industries has the potential to consume vast quantities of CO2 and displace fossil fuel based materials. Um, we're also looking at odour mitigation in gas scrubbers. So there's lots and lots of applications from, that require odour control from cooker hoods to AD plants. Wastewater treatment is a very interesting area of development. From work, some work that was done externally by a company working in this area on our material, they found better surface ion exchange with our biochar product when compared to activated carbon. Um, now I don't have, unfortunately, I haven't got ownership of this data so it wasn't, and it wasn't shared with me. But that was the in telephone conversation. They said it was actually it performed better than AC for what they were for their application. 
We're currently in negotiations regarding bulk um, anaerobic, uh, sorry, activated carbon regeneration. And we, the proposal is for us to produce uh, a, like an intermediate step to, so that they can be activated later on. So that would be, we would do the first step. So we would carbonize, we would densify the, um, the, the carbon content, and then we would sell this material to them for steam or chemical regeneration. The next thing is the activated carbon regeneration itself. Um, the, we've been looking to the possibility of this, either thermally or chemically. The crucial property of this material is the surface area, and we've got the, we've got the equipment to test it, but unfortunately the supply of liquid nitrogen isn't ideal in this area. So we're looking to come to some kind of agreement with the research for this facility. Uh, it wouldn't be a presentation by me if there wasn't a little plug to advertise our products. So yeah, we have a, a contractual obligation in fact. So if you choose, do choose to burn fuels to keep warm, I think this is the best solution. It's marketed as harvest flame, produces great heat and is 100% renewable and crucially it's target carbon tax free. Uh, there's limited stockists, but if you want to try some in your stove, open fire or chimney, there's a link to the Corp Superstores underneath, or you can buy it across the Weybridge here in Arigna. Uh, I previously talked about uh, pro-biocarbon. So we have an agreement to produce high-grade biochar, which is over 80% carbon for them, and which is inoculated with their proprietary bacteria. The products are for soil amendment, and they're sold in paper bags, as you can see on the left, and they're sold directly on their website and in some garden centres. Um, if you need biochar for soil amendment, obviously, go to the Bro Biocarbon website. The, Karen's probably best place to talk about the, uh, the research on biochar in the growing media uh, for the soil amendment purposes, but it's aimed towards its application as an alternative to environmentally unfriendly substrates, such as peat, vermiculite and perlite. So these studies, including trials here, have shown that biochar reduces nitrogen and phosphorus leaching improved water efficiency of growing media, improved plant fresh weight and root development, uh, improvement of disease resistance and offsetting or reversing of carbon footprints. Karen's material or the, the material that by carbon is enriched so they add beneficial bacteria to it. So they, you, she uses uh, bacillus subtilis. Um, it's, They've been part of this development, it means they've been looking at in detail the uptake of material and to minerals in the plant, plant growth, plant hormone growth levels, um, siderophores, which make iron available to the plant, but uh, also acting as a food source and benefit for plants and beneficial fungi, the, the cell plant stage. Uh, We've tested, this is R&D equipment, so we've, we've tested most biomass samples for suitability for conversion through our process. And now we're testing products for emissions, mechanical durability, and binders that are more suited to the products. We're also pushing the butt forward the boundaries, boundaries of R&D for biomass conversion to clean and burning fuels, and testing products in new eco-design stoves. We think that we're well poised for the future, but, um, Think that the Irish bioeconomy would, as a whole, would benefit from incentives to wean ourselves off fossil fuels for growers, producers, and customers alike. This is the material that we produce from olive stone. Uh, this is the 80, over 80% 80 of carbon, so typically 80 to 85%, um, and it's 95% of it is less than five millimeters. The photo on the right is from a scanning electron microscope and it clearly shows the porous nature of the product. And this is the start of the rapid increase in surface area that occurs during the carbonization reaction. For biochar, ours is actually relatively low surface area. Um, if compared to activated carbon, we have about 33 meters squared per gram and activated carbons will be much higher. They will be you know, in the thousands to 2000 meters squared per gram. But that doesn't seem to be a problem for the applications that we're, we're looking at at the moment, um, which is interesting because the, um, the biochar certificate, the, the European of the biochar certificate is, looks at, they would expect more than 150 uh, meters squared per gram. So there's a little bit of disparity there, but 
if it, if it works, then I, I'm not entirely sure if that's much of a problem. This would be the answer to the question, why is biochar so much more expensive than the torrefied biomass? And it's largely due to the losses and costs. Um, you need about two and a half tons of biomass to make one ton of biochar. Um, and you get a, a lower thermal efficiency because you release an awful lot of tar as a, as a result of that. And that is, that's lost. You, you don't, you, you know, so you don't retain that carbon because that, that is given off as carbon dioxide, tars and other, other materials. Torrefied biomass retains a, a, the vast majority of the energy. So it's a bit more of a, uh, and we use that we reuse the heat. So that's why it's much more efficient to run this. Uh, and finally, this is a, the cautionary tales for grown-ups. It's an oblique reference to bedtime stories that my dad used to read to me, which was cautionary tales for children. Um, I think the first point here is self-evident. The market is still embryonic for the for locally produced material, and there there are lack of large-scale trials and very and verifiable scale-up research. Now we we're selling biomass in bulk and bagged for um, for um, uh, for Karen. But I'm, I'm contact, contacted fairly regularly by people who see the potential of biochar for their specific market, but they're waiting for some kind of EU directive to be passed to make it viable, be it in terms of carbon sequestration payments or emissions reductions. But for, unfortunately for most, the, the cost of biochar is actually too high without some kind of appropriate subsidy. From the, the solid fuel industry, we've learned that unless there's strong enforcement of any kind of laws or rules, then the, the legislation is fairly meaningless. You know, um, there's, there's, uh, there are little enforcement of the current laws uh, regarding smokeless fuels. There are very few um, prosecutions for people selling things in smoke, uh, uh, low smoke fuels in a, in a, in a, or outside of the smokeless zones. Uh, and from the government's own research on coal, peat and wet wood, the vast majority of the emissions come from these three, three, three products. Um, so, yeah, it's, there's a kind of, there's this sort of thing of unintended consequences. The account for the, the vast majority of particulate emissions, but moving away from solid fuels or smokeless fuels meant that that small towns particularly that weren't covered by the, the smoky coal ban have now got higher emissions than what they had when they, when they started. Um, if the government are serious, I think, about climate change, then they need to incentivize carbon sequestration to at least double the amount of carbon tax. So, you know, 100 euros a tonne of CO2 sequestered needs to be made available to, to farmers and in industry now, not in 2030. Uh, rapid deployment of an indigenous, indigenous biochar industry will create jobs, it will drive decarbonisation really quickly, and it will secure island status as a truly green colour in colour, sorry, country in colour and in heart. Uh, I'm done. So, uh, yeah, thanks for listening. And if you have lots of questions, please get in contact uh, or feel free to uh, contact me directly. We're very, very open to collaborative work. Um, we, we work collaboratively with loads and loads of, loads of people and we're very open to get new products, uh, uh, new feedstocks and obviously Irish sourced material. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Robert, for your um, excellent presentation um, and thanks indeed for your assistance and support to the Irish Bioenergy Association um, as part of the Redirect project. And again, we look forward to working with you as part of this 3C project. Um, so, and there's a couple of questions which we will come to, uh, which are relevant to your presentation um, in a few couple of minutes. We do hope that you can uh, remain with us until 11.30 when we will finish up. Um, uh, I just want to now go to uh, Morris Ryan. So, um, Morris is um, a director and co-owner of Greenbelt Limited, Ireland's largest private forestry group. And also, um, Morris is the uh, Vice President of the Irish Bioenergy Association. 
Um, thanks, Morris, for joining us this morning. And just by way of introduction, and I'll bring in the rest of our speakers in a couple of minutes. But before I do that, um, would you be able to give us a quick outline of your own business and your own development of, of biochar and biochar products and how it's benefiting your uh, industry? Thanks, Sean, and thanks, Arbia, for, for hosting the event. It's been, been a very informative one, even uh, for, for me, who's been immersed a little bit in, in the biochar side of things. So we, we obviously are a forestry company, and we've been trying to look at other ways um, of, of adding value to the forestry estate, particularly the private forestry estate. And a client in, excuse me, introduced us to biochar a couple of years ago, and we, we developed with him a process where we produce biochar from the lower grade material that comes out of a forest, known as pulp, we'll say, um, from softwoods and hardwoods. Predominantly, we're using softwoods to produce biochar. Our focus would be to use that in soil amendment uh, processes and, in particular, reforestation projects. Um, we're act actively working with UCD, looking at it uh, from the mitigation of runoff in, um, in harvesting activities, particularly on, on, on peatlands. So there's the, the applications, as everybody sort of mentioned, are, are, are vast and, and wide, but we're trying to look at them particularly from a, a, um, a sort of land management and particularly forestry use in the short term. And um, thanks, Robert, uh, or um, Morris. And can you just maybe outline, um, uh, particularly relevant to your own sector, but relevant to Ireland Inc., the opportunities and benefits that development of this sector can bring to the country as a whole from a wide variety of uh, factors? Well, certainly, you know, obviously from a forestry perspective, looking at it from that narrow, that narrow vision of it, it's, it's a lot of concerns are around um, the environmental impact that forestry may have on, on, on the local areas. Utilizing biochar within it absolutely mitigates anything like that. It obviously continues to capture the carbon within it. And that brings on from a broader perspective then that the, the carbon emissions uh, and the, cap, the carbon capturing uh, potential from biochar, particularly from the agricultural purposes. And um, um, as you see, there's a big call for forestry across or to, to plant trees on every farm across the country that the agricultural side of things reduces its emissions. These things can be seen together um, in unity and working cooperatively. Um, and, and has been alluded to by the other speakers, the application of biochar through everything from road construction, building construction, you name it, it's there. And that now brings forestry um, and timber related products um, more to the fore. And it, uh, it, it just it, it closes that gap from a circular economy perspective, which is sorely missing really in, in the country, but is, is badly needed, you know. Okay, Morris, and just a final question or second last question, I have one final question, but second last question. You mentioned that you're using pulp wood, softwood and hardwood, uh, but predominantly softwood. How important is the consistency of the input material? And do you envisage that brash and other waste residues from the forest sector could be used in the future to produce biochar and provide a use for those materials which might necessarily be um, there at the moment? My understanding of it, and, and I will bow down to some superior technical knowledge that, that, that's on the, on the panel today, but certainly a brash can be used maybe for a lower quality biochar. Um, we've used the, we're using pulp, but the consistency of material going into the process is essential um, to ensure that the char coming out is consistent across the entire process, that when you deliver biochar to a client, that it is from the top of the bag to the bottom of the bag, it is of the same standard and high quality you know, that has the same carbon content and can deliver exactly what it can do. Obviously, using different materials will produce a different quality char, but that, again, has an application and comes at a different price point. So I would definitely think something like brash has, has an opportunity in that. And, and, you know, we've mentioned anaerobic digestion as part of this, and that the lower grade char is, is more mostly applicable in that, that, that regard, as I understand it. You know? Okay, and finally, Morris, um, I know you were an active participant in the Redirect project and attended some of the overseas trips to Wales and um, other areas as part of the project. And uh, I know you're a willing participant in terms of the 3C project. Can you just outline from your perspective how you think the 3C project will benefit um, you as a, and your company and indeed benefit this sector and industry in Ireland? 
I think having a collaborative approach like the 3C project is, is absolutely essential for this, uh, for any kind of industry to, to take off, particularly biochar. Um, everybody knows, I was at a conference years ago in, in the States and everybody, there was 200 people there producing biochar, but nobody had a market for it. Something like the 3C project can develop that. Um, got a great coordinator there in Stephen and he's bringing people along uh, on a journey making or bridging gaps there in terms of information, in terms of, of um, who's working in the industry to make sure that things are actually actively happening. So something like that and, and, and with Erbia behind it is absolutely essential. It's, it's, it's hugely important to the whole thing. It wouldn't happen without it. Okay, um, thanks very much, Morris. Um, if you can stay with us and if I can ask um, our other uh, presenters this morning to just uh, switch on your microphones and switch on your cameras. Um, there are a number of questions which are, are coming uh, through and they fall into a number of kind of thematic areas. So um, I suppose I'll open up with you, um, Robert, mm -hmm. um, in terms of a question there from Bruce. Um, uh, has, has there been any independent EU trial work conducted on the benefits of using biochar to show an increase in uh, grown herbage in agriculture? Um, and I suppose this would also tie into um, other trial work around biogas and, and other areas as well and use in slurries. So would you be able to give us an outline of any, um, your understanding of what work has been done from a trial perspective, um, both at an Irish and EU level? Uh, it, yeah, uh, the manufacture of biochar is kind of my area. The, uh, the, the sort of the, net, the uses of it are less so. Um, I'd, I'd probably defer to to Karen. I mean, she's she's on. I believe she's on the call. If you if you want to unmute mute her and ask her the question, because uh, she would be she would have a lot more information on that than I would. Well, I, in fairness to Karen, I haven't um, prepped <laughs> that she would join, so I won't. Um, okay. I, I won't do that, Karen. But we would be happy to um, to to take your input um, uh, if you if you wish. But uh, if not, we could maybe get your input at a future webinar. But um, in terms of uh, research, Stephen, would you be able to give us some outline uh, of any research that you know has been take, has taken place? on this particular uh, topic and um, um, if you could um, maybe just give us an outline uh, of see, that. I see Karen has just popped in there. Can so you Stephen before we go to Karen if we could just go to yeah, you. Yeah. Perfect well there's plenty of uh, lab based uh, trials but I, I don't know like a wide scale trial based in Europe. Uh, there's plenty that happen in America and other places but not so much a uh, like a full-scale trial uh, in the EU, uh, so I'm not I'm not aware of that. But Karen might have a yeah. Uh, you're welcome, Karen, and thanks yeah. for joining us. Um, a little unexpected, but happy to have you. Um, do you want to give us your own thoughts and insights into this area? Um, well, we did a, a small potato trial this year with Robert Spirechar um, up in County Donegal and it was just on raised beds. So um, we had an organic grower who grew it for us. So on the raised beds, um, we were there for, for um, harvesting and the potatoes that were grown in biochar, the, the, the clay didn't cling to the, to the potato. We had um, at the end, I think it was something like, maybe you can remember Robert, it was something like the, the yield was higher in the control than in the biochar application. But when we took out the diseased ones and we took out the undersized potatoes, we were something like 15 point, sorry, the control was 15.1 kilos and the biochar was 17.3 kilos. Yeah. Just to sort of say that, that that trial was, you know, it was done in under, it was a it was an organic grower that was uh, that was doing that trial as a result and he just in the the dosage rates were he just basically took a bag a, a one one twenty roughly seventeen to twenty kilo bag uh, mixed into his uh, into his plot but there was definitely the, the d disease resistance seemed to be uh, evident there there was far less disease material there okay and uh, thanks very much Karen and thanks Robert and if you can stay with us Karen that would be quite quite useful and um, so, and just to, I suppose, to, um, to answer your question, Bruce, as well, 
we will be looking as part of the project and what research is out there. And uh, also as part of this project, we do hope to have an ongoing engagement via a webinar and uh, we will be having a conference in, um, in a, maybe in a year, year and a half's time, hopefully after we've overcome the issues around COVID. Um, and we'd be happy to engage with you and others um, uh, giving your interest in, in this particular area and maybe point you in the direction of some work which has been done and which we can collate. Um, just to move on and a couple of the other questions. Um, there's one um, comment and question from uh, Richin um, around uh, the addition of biochar in terms of uh, biogas production. Uh, we understand and you have noticed that uh, some work has been done in UCC on this particular area by Professor Jerry Murphy. And I know myself and Robert have also engaged with one of our members around this, this particular area. And Robert, I might just go to you um, around the potential uh, for trialing uh, biochar in biogas and it's uh, the increase in yield in biogas as a result. Would you be able to just comment on that for me, please? Yeah, well, I, I, from the question I've just been looking at here, um, is it actually asking about making biochar from the digestate? So this is actually using the digestate initially uh, and then re reapplying it. Um, the feedstock property is going to be very, you you're going to have to have very, very good quality uh, organic feedstock going in. Um, this is part of the problem that with AD, particularly that with, um, with food waste and contaminants, if there are contaminants in the AD plant itself, then these will be, you know, re, they will be passed on into the biochar. So it might it might make it that it's not suitable for other applications further down. Um, I'm I'm just I'm, I'm not sure what he says the, the relationship between the feedstock properties because the feedstock will be if they're using dairy sludge. The the ultimate aim for this would be to increase the solids loading of the AD plant. To reduce the moisture content by by feeding some of that back in and also stimulating microbial growth, um, we haven't done it. We haven't actually got any um, anaerobic digestate as yet, and we haven't. So it's there's going to have to be a further processing step. That's the kind of the issue. You have to get densify that up, more dewater it, de de and densify it up before you could then process it further on. And this is going to add quite a lot of extra processing and money to the uh, to the cost, it might not be worth it. It might be worth adding the the residues, the easier um, easier mean materials to process into it in, initially. Okay, um, thanks, um, Robert, for that. Uh, over to you, Tony. Just um, some questions there from Frank, um, and if you could just. Um, uh, in terms of your collaboration with ProSilva Ireland and ProSilva Europe, um, do you want to comment on that? And um, I'm not sure how relevant it is to this particular topic, but uh, it has been asked all the same as a question. And if you could just um, maybe give us any thoughts you have on, on or what collaboration is taking place. Yeah, um, I think maybe to just, uh, in, in, in fairness to the question, maybe to frame it a little bit. Um, and I suppose what ProSilva do, uh, they, they look at a, a holistic approach to forestry and continuous cover forestry and close to nature forestry. So um, from, from, and then from my own point of view, what I do in DAFM is uh, I manage the forest research program. Um, I also work uh, uh, in the bioeconomy. Um, so I have, I have kind of two roles there. So in relation to the forest research, uh, we fund a number of, uh, of competitive calls. We have, we have stuff ongoing at the moment and we will continue to put out um, uh, calls into the future as well. We're guided by our FARI document, which uh, clearly outlines the importance of, um, it's a strategic agenda for forest research. It clearly outlines the importance of close to nature forestry and being able to justify uh, the sustainability of, of our industry. So I think the, 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 the question maybe isn't so much, shouldn't be so much directed to myself um, because I operate a competitive program, I can't be directly involved with uh, ProSilva, but I do appreciate the work that they do. And I think the, 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 the core concept of what they do should be applied, certainly should be applied to not just forestry, but to agriculture and other areas that we need to be able to look at sustainability and circularity to ensure 
that anything we do as we go forward um, closes the loop, as I heard somebody saying previously. So it's, a, it's an important part of it. But also, you know, we do have a commercial aspect to look at and we need to be able to produce uh, timber commercially. So it's, it's to find that balance. Um, we do have a, a, on the department website, I might post a link, um, we have a number of afforestation grants. Uh, there's native woodland schemes. Uh, I'll, I'll post some links um, to, the, to, to the audience as well, if that's okay. Thanks very much, John. Tony. Um, Thank you. Just um, uh, Steve there, um, I suppose it's addressed to you, Stephen. Uh, thanks, you for, thanks you for your presentation and for showcasing the project. And obviously um, his interest in maybe you collaborating with students in Sligo IT. And I know you'd be probably happy to do that as a graduate and everything. So just do you want to comment yeah. on that Steve, yeah. briefly? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. would be delighted to uh, collaborate and to come in and chat to the students if COVID allows it, or if not, present online. But uh, I'll, I'll be in touch, Steve. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Colin, just a, a comment there. Um, Dave just picked up on a comment you made about animal welfare standards uh, due to Brexit. Again, it's going a little off topic, but I suppose just to uh, briefly um, close out the, the query. Do um, you want to comment on that, Colin? Uh, yes, and I will be careful what I say. Um, uh, for those of you who may be not quite aware of what's been going on in the UK over the last four years, um, somehow the, the present government procured itself an 80 seat majority in the House of Commons last uh, December. This means that they can basically put in place any legislation they want um, with very little ability for the opposition to resist it. There are two pieces of legislation which are, have either just gone through or are going through, one of which is the Internal Markets Bill, which gives the government of the day draconian powers, um, and the other one is the Agriculture Bill, which has just been passed, and that has failed to put into law the um, requirement for uh, domestically produced or imported foodstuffs to meet uh, basic EU um, safety, environmental impact and animal welfare standards. Um, the government says that of course it will abide by the current law but it allows them to change that law unilaterally if they want to do a trade deal with somebody else. The big fear amongst British farmers is now that this will open the floodgates to uh, low quality intensively produced food from other countries across the globe in order to keep food prices down and it also means that UK farmers who are by and large trying to raise animal welfare standards and reduce environmental impacts are going to be faced with a stark choice of either abandoning those and trying to join this race to the bottom to produce bulk of quantities of cheap food or going out of business and being bought up by multinationals. That is the fear. Okay, um, thanks Colin for that intervention. Um, just to, as we're coming close to the end, there are a few outstanding questions and comments, so um, I'll try and, uh, we'll try and address them as, as best we can. Um, thanks Joan for your uh, comment and, and question, excellent presentations. Um, it was very interesting, the different projects in different countries. Just wondering have we had any local authorities or other interested parties express an interest or explore possibly a similar setup to those in Wales uh, with their beer. Um, so in the presentation, um, you would have seen, or sorry, in Stephen's presentation, you would have seen as part of the, um, the project uh, video that um, the Baden-Baden municipality was, was showcased. Um, and I think that's a model that we, which could be expanded in Ireland. Um, and also I'm sure the uh, set up in Wales in terms of community farms could also be a concept which could be looked at and we hope to maybe explore both and collaborate with the local authorities as part of the um, the, the project uh, and thanks again for your attendance and your contribution. Um, a question there Robert for you uh, from Michael, uh, how does the energy density um, of harvest flame compared with say low smoke coal and how does their particulate emissions compare with natural gas. So, um, uh, okay, our harvest got... flame product is, um, low smoke coal would be 32 roughly uh, megajoules per kilo on a dry basis. Uh, harvest flame is a, between 22 and 23 megajoules per kilo. So it's 
Wood on a dry and again on a dry base is about 19. So it's it's somewhere, it's like a hybrid. It's it's more like lignite or um it would be like a high grade peat briquette, that that type of energy density. Um, but particulate emissions, we've actually got a, a project that we've just completed and it was done at UCD with um, a, 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 another collaborative uh, project on particulate emissions and we burnt them uh, and we compared Harvest Flame and Ecobright, which is our other, which is our low smoke coal against coal and peat and wood and Harvest Flame did incredibly well. Um, but compared to natural gas, it's uh, you're talking factors away. Natural gas is incredibly low. Um, you're still going to get particulates. If you burn anything, you're going to get particulates. That's the, the, the upshot of, of anything. You can bust things, you get particulates. But the, the reduction of volatiles for Harvest Flame seems to be that we've reduced the, the volatile content just enough to, to and, and the higher burning, the hot burning, means that it, we, we don't get as much uh, off at that point. Thanks, uh, Robert, and thanks, Michael, for your questions. I'm happy to discuss further with you um, in collaboration with Robert, if you wish. Um, question there, Stephen, over to you um, from, um, it's from, let's see it there. Uh, sorry, Tom. Um, what assistance and from whom is available to test different biomass products or, or to produce biochar? and to research the use of that biochar in soil, compost, fertilizer, or briquette products. Maybe just uh, outline what potentially the yeah. project will do in this regard and um, what, what assistance is available from the project and others. Yeah, uh, so and certainly- be brief, Stephen, because we're coming yeah. to the end. So. Uh, certainly, in terms of uh, testing of biomass products, that's going to be one of the things we're exploring uh, as part of the CC lab. Um, so they're still working on the, the parameters for the CC lab, but that will hopefully be finalized by New Year and uh, hopefully we'll be in a position to, to begin uh, testing of people's different uh, biomass types. In terms of uh, research uh, and assistance uh, for biochar and a soil compost, um, that's not something we'll be testing as part of the project, but it's something that will be open to collaboration with, uh, for instance, the Institute of Technology uh, the higher education institutes, uh, possibly the likes of Chagas, but there's, there's nothing concrete set out for that just yet. Okay, and thanks um, for that. Um, just a couple of questions from Thomas. Um, any interest in animal slurry has been used as a feedstock and um, one for Robert, if there was a large volume of low grade biochar, is there a means to blend this into current fuel products? So maybe just if you can take the one of the fuel products and Robert and I'll ask Stephen about the slurry. Okay, yeah, um, it, for us, it depends on the, um, yes, it, if it's low grade biochar, it, it's, it's all about densification. It's all about making it into something. Um, we have a very specific type of briquetting plant, which doesn't lend itself to very, very fibrous materials, but there are other people that can do that. So making, making pellets might be a, a really good thing to do, do with it. Um, we have worked, very closely with Crest, the Centre for Renewable and Sustainable Technology up in uh, Enniskillen, and they have the ability to do small batches and make pellets. And, and you can, if, if it's a company based in Ireland, you can get an innovation voucher for about 5,000 euros, which will help fund this, this research, if that's what you want to do. Potentially we could, but you, you, that would be my first point of call. Okay, and slurries as a feedstock, Stephen? Um... Yeah, so uh, I think horse manure is one of the, the, the samples we tested during redirect um, uh, for conversion to biochar. And it, once it's at the right moisture content and it's been dewatered proper, properly, it, it, it does carbonize pretty well. Um, now, it's not something we're looking at uh, as part of the five to f uh, or the three product categories we're looking at, but uh, it, it has been done and can be done. Okay, and just a, a final question or comment, and I'll take it myself just, and then uh, to conclude, I'll just ask for a final sum up point from each of our contributors this morning. Um, any interest in agricultural waste such as gorse and hedge cuttings, would this have commercial value for farmers to encourage them to supply uh, for biomass or is there a pilot looking at collecting this type of waste? So um, certainly we have tested as part of the 
Um, the project, um, gorse and hedge cuttings. Um, I know that um, as a farmer myself, on a part-time basis, I supplied some gorse for that testing and, and others did as well. And the results came back very favorably from the perspective of the carbon content of gorse, but the yield was quite low from a biochar perspective. Certainly, um, it does possibly present opportunities, but and maybe it can be looked. This can be looked at further as part of the biomass to biochar project, the EIP project, which has been headed up by by Bernard and his team. Um, but to give commercial value, it's a bulky material. It's of low value, uh, and so it would have to be looked at in terms of how it could be collected um, efficiently and used, and maybe it could be better processed at a local farm level and utilised in at a farm level rather than a mass collection and central processing. Uh, and I think that is the focus of the EIP uh, biomass to biochar project um, to use that type of material, but also rush material. So um, I think that concludes our um, all the questions and feedback. And uh, just to sum up in order of presenter, um, Tony, do you just want to give us literally 30 seconds of a sum up from your perspective on this topic? Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, so it's, I think it's a very interesting area. Um, but I think we need to underpin sustainability and circularity in anything we do uh, going forward, because that's, that's going to be uh, key and crucial. Um, just a very quick sum up from myself. Thanks. Thanks very much, Tony. Uh, Stephen, uh, do you want to just make your final contribution? Yeah. So the main focus of GC is to kind of encourage product development. Um, so if you have any ideas for a, a, a biochar based product or service that you want to explore further, just get in touch with me. Um, and to aid and assist that, I have added the email address of myself and Stephen to the chat uh, function. So they won't be available obviously once the webinar is finished, but if you could copy them out into your desktop or your email, that would be useful at this point and we'd be happy to collaborate with you. Um, next up is Colin, do you want to, and thanks for joining us this morning, Colin, do you want to quickly summarize from your perspective um, your final thoughts? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, it's been fascinating to, to listen to all the inputs this morning uh, and, and also to read the questions. Uh, and it's clear that uh, using pyrolysis and torrefaction to produce highly intense carbon products is going to be a very powerful tool for us in, in both stimulating uh, a resurgent and new circular local economy and also combating climate change. But I would encourage people to think beyond the immediate direct action because there are as many wins that you can make, make from the point of view of both the economy and, and the climate from displacing other materials. So mm. not just displacing fossil fuels or displacing artificial fertilizers, but displacing non-local products, which are energy intense to produce and to transport. So this is this idea of thinking almost like a mini life cycle analysis, every action you're gonna take, what are the added wins that you could that you could make and that's particularly applicable to farming where transport of products and materials over long distances is now commonplace. Okay thanks Colin. Uh, Robert uh, if you could just conclude from your perspective. Yeah just to continue what, what Colin said that there's this sort of thing of unintended consequences of, of, of doing one thing that you think is going to help and it doesn't at all. Um, but this, with biochar, what I'm realizing is the more I'm researching it, the more I'm working in this field is that there are just so many cascade benefits. It almost seems to be like, a, even if you go away from the carbon sequestration down to the other, you know, increasing the, the methane yields of AD to addition in all the products available and, they could, and for cosmetics, literally there are thousands of different applications I can't, <laughs> I can't do everything, unfortunately. Um, but we have to, we have to focus on the ones that are going to give us, I think, the, the quickest wins. I think that's the, that's the upshot. Okay, Morris, over to you uh, for any concluding remarks from yourself. Thanks, Sean. I'll keep it brief. But to continue on um, Robert and, and Colin's theme, and I'll, I'll focus on my forestry bias, but to bring forestry and agriculture more in alignment, um, that that circular economy can be completed. You look at a dairy farm and the cascading approach from feeding it to animals into manure, improving uh, grass yields, and thus your milk yield, uh, and the runoff into trees planted on your farm with biochar as a, as a, as a soil amendment beneath it. Um, that that's just adds so much value to the whole process. So uh, I'll keep it brief, because I know you're trying to wrap it. 
<laughs> okay, and Karen, have you any uh, final uh, comment or any uh, insights you'd just like to share with us to conclude? Um, I suppose it's the cascading uses of these things, like um, if we can develop a product for animal feed, we can prove, you know, it uh, reduces the somatic cell count in animals, less veterinary fees, uh, pass it through the animal then as an amendment to the soil. So it's just that there's so many avenues to explore. Okay, and um, thanks very much, Karen. And we look forward to exploring those over the next two years, two and a half years as part of this project. Um, to conclude, I'd like to thank and acknowledge the work of Teresa O'Brien in acting and working behind the scenes um, in making sure that all of this ran very smoothly this morning. So thanks very much again to Teresa uh, for your assistance and help as always. Um, thanks to Stephen. Uh, thanks to all our speakers this morning and presenters uh, for joining us and taking time out of your busy schedules. And most importantly, thank you all for attending this morning. Uh, we are excited about this pro the prospect of this project and the potential that this uh, project presents. And um, uh, we do look forward to further collaborating with you in the, in the near future uh, and keeping you up to date and up to speed as to what's happening through the project. And again, as, we, as Stephen and, and, uh, said, uh, feel free to get in touch if you have particular feedback thoughts or um, areas you'd like us to work on as part of this project. So without further ado, we'll conclude at that. And uh, just to thank you all again, and um, thanks to all our panelists as well. So thank you, everyone, and we'll see you all again soon. Thank you, Sam. Thanks very much. Yes. Thank you very much.